Welcome to the Smart Property Investment Show, the podcast by investors for investors. Good day, how you going, Phil Tarrant, uh, host, Smart Property Investment Show, SPI Show. Call it SPI these days. I'm still not used to it. I've been calling it Smart Property Investment for so long. It's still smartpropertyinvestment.com.au, SPI. Um, but uh, welcome to the show. But this is a special show because this is the intersection of a number of different aspects of my professional life. Yes, uh, first and foremost, I am a property investor, maybe, um, a journalist first, maybe, property investor second, I still don't know sometimes. Uh, any given day, I'll probably give you a different answer. Uh, but uh, for those of you familiar with the Smart Property Investment Show, I speak about property investment to property investors and people that help people with property. Uh, on the other side of the ledger, uh, we have a very big brand here at Manta Media, which is the the, sort of the parent company of all these sort of media assets and events and stuff called Real Estate Business. And you know, as you would expect, the name says real estate business. It's about real estate, the business of real estate. So this is agents, real estate agents, property buyers, property managers, conveyances, the whole cohort of people that act and operate within the profession of real estate. Uh, and from what I understand, if you look at it, I think one in eight Australians are somehow connected with the real estate in Australia uh, as a profession. I think that will probably also include builders and tradies and all that sort of stuff. So I sit there and I sometimes think, what is real estate? Is real estate around bricks and mortars? Maybe. Uh, is real estate around people? Well, most likely and probably. Uh, but is it around how they connect and engage with each other, which is technology? And I think it's uh, one of all of them uh, in a, a mix of what would some people say would be madness at times, but we're all invested in, connected to the bricks and mortar real estate. But how do we as property professionals podcasters, for example, whether or not I can call myself a property professional, uh, using technology like podcasting uh, to help people make better property decisions, whether they're owner-occupiers or investors. So it's just a, an idea I've been musing about for a little while, this sort of interconnection between the property themselves, so bricks and mortars, people and technology, and how we can make it all work a bit better. There's some people who have been were looking at this for a long time, the real estate uh, real estate industry of Australia has recently put out some stuff around what they think the future of property management is going to look like. And there's always government legislators thinking about how they can change the rules to make property more of an even keel and an even playing field. Uh, we're all aware of uh, a lot of scuttlebutt coming out of the, uh, the, the respective governments at the moment, whether it's uh, state, local or federal around uh, the housing crisis, uh, the rent crisis, uh, supply and demand equation. So Australia very much is uh, held hostage in many ways to its property markets in shaping the happiness, the uh, engagement, the attention, the economy of the nation is intrinsically connected with it. So we like to cover that on both the Smart Property Investment Show and also Real Estate Business, the secrets of top ones are dangerous. So there's a bit of a crossover podcast between the two. And I'm probably going to do a little bit more of these moving forward because to try and give some sense to this interconnectivity between technology, people and property. For those of you, most of you would know I'm a journalist and also a property investor. I'm also a director or chairman of um, a prop tech company called Managed, uh, which is a change in a way in which uh, property management transactions take place, which remove trust accounting out of uh, real estate um, rental transactions. Pretty cool stuff. Um, so I'd like to think I'm connected and potentially qualified, but there's other people who are probably more qualified than me or see the world the same way. One of them is uh, Tom Richards. He's uh, the CEO of a new prop tech called Cohabit. Uh, I've worked with Tom uh, previously for, for a number of years. He was uh, actually the founder uh, of uh, Managed, and it was uh, largely an idea that he ideated um many years ago and we've been working together. He's no longer with Manage. He's out there now creating something new and very, very cool called Cohabit. We're going to have a chat about that today, but also what's going on in property technology and how technology is shaping and changing the way in which real estate transacts and the way in which those people, those professionals, buyers, agents, property managers, sales agents, buyers, agents, everyone, all in sundry, connect and engage. Tom, how are you going? Good, mate. Thanks for having me back. It's good to see you. Seven it, years since we first did our first one of these. Is it really that long? It sure is. Well, thanks, um, thanks for your support and your insights and your engagement over many years with with Managed. Um, I know you've moved on and now you've created something pretty cool, and we'll have a chat about that today. But um, you know, formative formative time for 
the real estate sector creating something like managed and completely changing and shaping the way in which rental transactions take place. Yeah, I mean, it was a wild ride and it still is. I mean, I'm obviously still quite connected, still very close friends with yourself and Alex and everyone else within the business. So it's great to sort of be in touch and and hear how it's progressing even now that I'm not here every day. Um, but it was always this avant-garde idea that uh, that when you had told somebody, you watch their head implode a little bit. But now it's become this almost second nature now. You talk about direct payments and automated payments and there's other players that have come out in the space and, and it's it's a very much a legitimate and really efficient way of doing things now. It's become accepted. Well, it so. is accepted and it's what the future will be and I don't want this to be me standing in my soapbox <laughs> banging on around manage. So I'll talk about it for only 30 seconds and then we can move on with it. But there is some context to it because, you know, my, my thesis and my point is the way in which real estate transactions or the way in which real estate has been done up until this point won't be the way in which it's done into the future. No. We're at a uh, this intersection where uh, the proliferation, integration of technologies having seismic shifts in the way in which property professionals will operate and how properties will transact and be managed moving forward. So technology is not going to remove the professionals out of real estate. Technology is only going to empower the professionals to do their roles more effectively in real estate, um, whether they're property managers, whether they're uh, real estate sales agents, uh, whether they're um, buyers agents, all and sundry, technology is going to be the panacea for changing and shaping the way which real estate takes place, which is going to be better outcomes for buyers and sellers and owners of real estate. So that's pretty much it. The, the value we saw in in managed is that um, directed automated payments for real estate transactions makes a lot of sense. Rather than your money sitting as a property investor in a trust account for a month and then it gets dispersed to you at the end of the month, why wouldn't you want that money in your offset account immediately? Yeah, exactly. And also, you know, not to say it happens a lot, but it does happen. Um, uh, someone not doing the right thing with their trust account, which still happens, trust account theft. So it's changed everything. It will be the way in which real estate rental transactions happen. So it's nice to be first and it's nice to still be the leader in that regards, but it's not a managed thing. You can see I'm quite sort of passionate around providing these tools as you are uh, for, for real estate moving forward. So um, are you in prop tech? Would you say you're a prop tech guy? I'd say a prop tech. Yeah, I do. You like do you like being in prop tech? I I don't like the tech part. I like the prop tech part, the yeah, prop the part, prop not part the tech that. parts, so to speak. Um, but I you're have... more about the utility of the technology Correct. rather than being a, a coding nerd. Exactly right. Yeah. I I have much much smarter people than me um, that surround me at Cohabit, and just like we did at Manage, I mean, we have, the team at Manage is is exceptional uh, when it comes to development. Mm. Um, so those guys they deal with that side of things, uh, that side, and I focus more on the product and the experience, but also the commercial outcomes is something that I've always focused on, having been there. And and done that within an agency um, and know how expensive it is to run a trust, the risk associated with it, even being just an everyday purchaser, tapping my card, pay IDing someone when I, I bought something on Marketplace half an hour ago, pay ID, instant transaction. Why would you wait? Why do you want to wait? Um, so that's that was always my thinking and my side and my experience, and that flowed through to the tech. So, so your backstory then, uh, once upon a time, was a property manager. Correct. Yeah, I started a real estate agency when I was quite young, 22, didn't really know what I was doing. Uh, ran that for a number of years uh, and then moved into project management and did about 15 client side renovations over the over a little while. So I've done both the, I like the real, real estate, estate property renos. Exactly. Yeah, right. Okay. Yeah. 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 So you've been analog as well as digital. Extremely analog. Yeah. yeah. Still am analog to a degree. <laughs> yeah, I see you on the uh, on the interweb always tinkering with stuff. So you you obviously Can't like sit still, you, mate. You, you, you like the analog but um <laughs> but this idea of people property and, and and technology it's this you know this interaction of how they all work in conjunction individually and in conjunction together to to change and shape the way in which real estate will take place do do you do you agree with my thesis that the people are always going to be the central part of property in Australia moving forward yeah, I, I certainly do. And there are industries that have tried to remove the people. I mean, if you look at banking, for one, you walk into a branch, and there's very few people left. The experience is completely gone. But when it comes to just transactions, it is just a transaction. But when you deal with property, there's emotion, there's deals, there's uh, there's people's lives um, that, as you mentioned before, it's uh, it, property links with people's lives very closely. Um, so having the human element is always going to be an important thing. Yeah, and, and it's always going to be 
a bit analog, right? Because people live in a property, you touch it, you feel it's it. It's physical. Yep. People have a emotive connection with property and then you have a car drive professionals who make it, right? You only need to turn on the TV. I was watching um, ABC last night, which I normally check out, just get a, a finger on a pulse of what's going on. It's probably the central issue outside of maybe some um, security situations in Australia right now is still the central guiding issue, which is framing and shaping most people's attitude towards happiness of living in Australia right now is, do I have a house to live in? Do I have connection to rents? Is it costing me too much money? Is it stopping and shaping my happiness in life because I can never buy a house? It is such a fundamental issue to Australia. Of course, yeah. And it impacts everything that you can do in your personal life as well. If property becomes more expensive, there's things you need to fix. It can impact the holidays, which then impact the kids. It has this flow on effect. So um, being connected to the property and being on top of all your property dealings is is extremely important. Mm, Yeah. So hopefully technology can play... uh, a bigger game. And technology has always sort of been around. I guess once upon a time, someone probably thought a filing cabinet was technology, right? You can put things in order. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. But tell, tell me about Cohabit. What does it do? So Cohabit is an information tool. Um, it's designed to be a, a data partner for anyone that touches a building. Um, we've started small. Uh, we're focusing on residential buildings. Uh, but essentially what we do is we use the existing building data and create a digital version. Um, I call it a digital twin, but that term gets thrown around. It can be something as simple as information or, or a full detailed breakdown 3D plan of a building. So we, we sit somewhere in the middle. Uh, but the idea is to allow people to access more information in real time about a building, um, specifically buyers when they want to purchase into a block, understand what they're buying into and not have to deal with 800 page strata searches full of gibberish and things they might not understand, um, waiting two weeks and paying several hundred dollars to access that information, all those kinds of things. Yeah, I, I recently bought uh, an apartment and you had to go through the process of dealing with the body corporate and had to, someone actually had to get in a car and drive to an office to sit there to go through all of the um, uh, the historic information around it all and then compile a big report and send to me. It was still quite analog. Yeah. Oh, there's lots of strata managers out there that still have manila folders full of information sitting in their office. And even the- Have you seen it? Do you like walk into offices and just go, oh my God, oh, that's just a Well, that's a bit scary. <laughs> yeah. I mean, we used to do it at Managed, right? Mm. We used to do the import of all the data from even the old systems when we used to migrate agencies onto the platform. Yeah. So we're doing something very similar. And the funny thing is that the experience that we had at Manage from moving people off these old file and storage systems systems is very similar to the skills that we need at Cohabit because we're still taking all that information and moving it into a digital format. So it still it still haunts me walking into offices and seeing manila folders, yeah. um, but it's just something we have to deal with. But it's back to my point is that it's a really unique moment in time for real estate. And let's talk about real estate because it, it is still, you would think, oh, wow, the, the world's gone digital. It hasn't really. So we're still talking about the digitization of real estate information to still put it online because I know a lot of when we we're within the, the managed context um, people were still talking about moving from desktop to cloud like it was a big deal oh yeah we're on the cloud now we're on the cloud now rather than having sort of desktop based software uh, so people are still trying to come to grips with the idea of like that information might be in a computer, but it sits on a server in your office rather than being accessible, readily accessible to everyone via the cloud. Yeah, it's like, a scary thought it, for some people. It's still a scary thought. So we're still in this, this this moment in time where information is still being digitized. In 20 years' time, I doubt you'll see, you know, a room full of manila folders. I'd, I'd like to think it's largely oh, paperless <laughs> by then, right? And, 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 and COVID being a great uh, enabler for changing attitudes towards signatures, like... You know, it's okay now. Most people accept a digital signature. Before COVID, and we're talking five, four, years, four years ago, you couldn't do a digital signature on stuff. So it had to be a wet signature on, on mortgage documents, for example. Like yep. we've moved on, we've moved on a lot, but there's still a long way to go, isn't there? Yeah, yeah, there certainly is. And I think it it is not so much the technology; it's, it's very much in the thinking. 
Um, and that's uh, that's one of the challenges that all prop tech businesses face, I think, is just the change in attitudes required to, to sell that product into their space. I mean, I've got a lot of friends in the industry, lots of really cool different products, and they all have that same problem, right? It's mm. just, it's education about the benefits and, uh, and and trying to make it seem not as scary for people that, uh, that might not be too comfortable with it. Welcome back, Phil Tarrant from Smart Prop Investment, Tom Richards from Cohabit. Now, Tom, before the break, you made a really good point. The technology is largely there and the technology continues to advance at a rate, which is going to be a huge enabler for supporting people working work in and around real estate moving forward. But your point was is that the mindsets for many property professionals and, and, and we're talking there's two audiences that we're talking to is property professionals and then property investors. So I'd say both of them. There's still people who can't move beyond the way in which they've always done it to the way that they can be doing it. And for property professionals, that is the tools now available to make their jobs easier, faster, um, more seamless, more transparent, give them more time back in the day to do more um, business building type thing. And for property investors, making their life easy to map and monitor their property portfolio. The technology is there and it's it, it, in, in droves. If anything, there might be too much of it, but people can't get the mindset shift to change the way they're doing stuff, which is holding everything back. What needs to change, do you think? So yeah, there's two sides to that hesitation. Mm. The first is just purely they're not comfortable with tech. Um, and that's on us to design something that's relatively easy to use. I mean, I use a lot of technology day to day. And even some of the biggest platforms like Google, you click on your admin button, it's scary. Um, I mean, we were doing it yesterday. We had to, I actually had to help the guys that manage to, to access something in, um, in the manage admin. And it was this memory of going into deep into these folders and admins and, and links. It just becomes very difficult. So when you're not used to using technology, that can be a really daunting task. Um, and people are maybe a bit worried about how it's going to impact their relationship with people when they don't know how to do something, all those kinds of things. But the other side is also they don't want the technology there. So an example of that is that when we um, launched Cohabit, we spoke with some really cool agencies, top of their game, and we also spoke with some of the smaller ones that maybe just just a smaller business, very old school. And when you talk about access to information for the buyers, the the top of the, their game agencies, like we want that information. We want that. We understand that will help. It will make the experience better. But then you get to the other end of like, oh, no, it might impact the sale. We don't want to do that. We want to keep that information as close to our chest as we can. So I think there's, it's not only just getting comfortable with the tech, it's getting comfortable that buyers and people that interact with the technology, they will get that information. So it's, it's around understanding that that will actually impact the experience if you don't go down that path and start sharing and openly communicating about what's going on. That's intriguing, the fact that one agency, the USP would be, we've democratised this information to make it easy to access so you can make decisions quicker. And on the other side of it, their USPs, no, we own the information, we lock it up and don't give people yep. access. So they have to use us. It's polar opposites. Exactly right. And ironically, the one that's that's openly giving that information is one of the, if not the top agency in the country. Mm. And all the ones that are sharing that information are the best in the business. Uh, so if you really want to boost your business, <laughs> embracing that technology <laughs> to uh, to provide a better experience for the customer is key. And, and and that's the people part of this sort of triad, which is you know the property, the people, and the technology. Because the the, the the properties you can look at it, you can touch it and feel it and hold it. It doesn't have a heartbeat, right? Um, uh, the people are the 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 questionable component of this because the technology should be largely finite, right? It does what you yep. need it and tell it to do. Um, but the people is is where the nuances are. So it, it, the mind boggles. So, so you work mainly with Stratomat. Could you just explain, and this is for our property investors, I guess, Stratomat, what do strata managers do? Um, how many properties would a strata manager managed? Is it like a property manager that's overstretched and always fighting against, you know, just the million things they need to do? Is strata management the same? Yeah, probably even worse, okay. to be honest. Oh. Um, it, they're much more stretched. You're talking several hundred emails a day. Um, very difficult to get them on the phone. Um, uh, a lot of manual admin. Um, we're finding agent, uh, strata companies moving onto the platform that are still using Microsoft Word to create notices and email them out manually, still managing their data in really old-fashioned ways. Um, but we're, we're focused on a building per se. So we, we, we like building data 
Um, and then the people that are connected to that building can access features from either their end. So that might be a buyer or an owner, or it might be a strata manager at the other end or a self-managed scheme. But the, the building it really is our core customer because we digitize it. So regardless of who's accessing it, the benefits all start from having a digital version of that block. So I, I own a unit block up in Queensland. It's not strata. I sort of own a lot and have a manager to it. So, so would I benefit from having everything centralised inside of Cohabit? Is that how it works? So you would give that that yeah. building a digital, essentially a digital presence, right? Yeah, that's correct. Yeah, digital yeah. view. Um, we create triggers for certain things around compliance and activities. Um, you can set recurring actions uh, for things like ongoing maintenance, all those kind of things. But it, it's, it creates and uses the data to essentially give you what I would have a personal credit score, we give to a building. So whereas Equifax would give me a, a personal score based on all of my financial dealings and, and, and my personal situation, and then ComBank would use that to lend to me, we take that philosophy and give the building information to a purchaser and a really simple health score so we can help guide a buyer into making sure they're making into the, the, the right decision. Um, and they can include or exclude certain criteria. So things might not be important to fill. You might not be too bothered about the environmental aspect of this particular block, whether it's got solar. So you can exclude that from your score and really understand how well suited that building is to you. Okay. So I can see a real need for this moving forward. And, and you're probably the right place right time because going back to the, the point around we're not building enough... Um, homes for people to live in, uh, the, the biggest, well, one of the biggest debates at the moment is that, again, it's a mindset shift. Uh, most people in Australia still feel as though they should be in a nice big house in the suburbs, this white picket fence thing, whereas the future, and, and even the New South Wales um, Premier is saying this, the future is high density dwellings like they have in like London and Paris. Uh, he's, he's got visions for boulevards of like, you know, three, four storey townhouses with units and flats and stuff into it. So as Australia expands, it's going to get a lot more units and largely the construct of that is the strata arrangement, right? So more and more, they're going to need greater digitization as information. So it sounds like you're at the right place, right time. Well, they're always going to have people living together mm. and it's going to become more commonplace, as you said. Um, and living together in a harmonious way is, is going to become more and more important. Um, and that's why Cohabit got its name. It was a bit of a joke, it was tongue in cheek. You, you are, you're living together, yeah. essentially. Um, you're in a relationship per se. Yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> being able to communicate openly and, uh, and understand what's going on and, uh, and, and, and join the community together is extremely important for everybody's well-being. And this is the people again, right? And, and you see it in, in a, a strata scheme, you might have four properties, you might have 400 properties in a strata scheme, these, these very large um, uh, developments these days. So you, you actually, you're in it together. Uh, and it's sometimes funny, sometimes quite sad. Some of the conflicts you see inside of strata arrangements and, you know, people with different views and opinions on how things should be done. It gets very politicised. I know some very fancy buildings in town are hugely politicised, right? Like it's a big, big deal. So yep. strata is pretty much the, the one bit you can go back to actually give you the the rules of the game so it can help the people do what they need. So this is your point that the information should be readily available and accessible because that should support decision making around strata arrangements. Yeah, correct. And it's yeah. not just strata. I mean, we're, we're looking at Cohabit as a model for wherever people need to live together. So okay. you, whether you cross the border and go down to Victoria and they call it something different, whether mm. you fly across the ocean and you land in London and it's common hold developments or the common interest developments, which are now millions of them throughout the United States, they're ultimately the same structure. There's people that share a common interest. They live in a building together and they need a set of rules and they need a platform to be able to communicate internally and manage their shared space. Um, so we've, we've made it quite simple when it comes to that. So we digitise the building where you live and then we've got plans to bring in different types of communities. So you might have a street, you might have a suburb, um, you might have a, a... Oh, so you can scale it up outside the building into a street. Any, any yeah. type of community, uh, yeah. ultimately, um, because you still need to be able to communicate with a community. So you might draw a line on a neighbourhood or something mm. along those lines. Well, that's so, what councils do, right? You know, correct. They, and often don't do a very good job and they have different rules for different things. And, and I think one of the, the opportunities 
it's also a challenge is that they will need to start providing with rapid speed the rezoning of multitude locations across the capital cities into high density types. They will. So it's the only way it's the only way we can feed and house Australia's population moving forward. So people need to get comfortable with the idea of inverted commas cohabiting. Yep, they certainly do. <laughs> is, and, and is that the education piece for you? Or is it mainly educating? Who do you call customer at the moment? Is the, is it the strata managers that you, you, you want them to actually have a digital profile of these buildings online? So the core customer for us is the buyer. Um, okay. that's Tell the, me about it. So the buyer uses it. That's correct. Okay. Yeah. So the idea is that rather than going through a strata search, you create a buyer subscription for the duration of your search um, and you just pay a monthly subscription and then you can access building data. Um, we create the data. Um, I, the term AI is thrown around a lot, around a lot these days with technology, mm. but we do have um, a, a system that essentially converts all of the digital, um, oh, sorry, all of the, the um, paper documents or any PDF documents into a digital format. And then it actually gets searched and creates these scores based on the data that the system's ingested. And okay. we uh, we do some trickery when it comes to presenting it. So it's much more simple, although you can still search through detailed information if you want. So the benefit is predominantly there for the buyer. Um, that's our core customer. But what we're finding is the buildings, they get huge value. So strata managers and the buildings themselves get huge value of having a digital version because ultimately they have to make that information available to a buyer anyway. That's a huge admin burden for How them. much time do strata managers spend on having to support the the transition of real estate assets inside of a tra- strata arrangement? How, how big it like? I went through a process of buying a unit. Is that like a big part of what they do is facilitating that? Yeah. I mean, the, the general feedback that I get from the industry is they're spending hours for every strata search that goes on within the building. And so there's no benefit for them. They don't get paid for that, do they? Nil benefit. Some no. of them charge for access to the documents, um, yeah. uh, but it's it wouldn't be a, a profit thing. It's just purely trying to minimise the amount of time that they spend collecting and collating all this information, yeah. which also becomes outdated. The thing with the, a Cohabit report is it's live and it's, uh, and, and it's in real time, mm. whereas the moment you create a PDF – it's outdated five minutes later and you've got to go and and recompile it again if something sells a week later because that information may or may not have changed. So what's the normal chain then? So if I'm buying a a unit and I'm thinking for our our investors here, but also real estate agents who need to facilitate all this. uh, If I'm buying a unit, I I would engage a conveyancer. So there may or may not be a real estate agent in there doing the deal, right? Um, I engage a conveyancer. The conveyancer would, would, usually or a solicitor would usually as part of a conveyancing process do a, a strata report um would they usually have their own people that they would send out to do this sort of stuff or there's companies that just do strata reports for the purpose of, of buying and selling real estate how does that work yeah so they, they would engage a strata inspector that yeah. would typically so what it's get... called a strata inspector Correct. okay yeah. so that's a someone's job is to be a strata inspector exactly right they go and view the records okay. and then they create a report for that purchaser and that could be for a purchaser and or for some other purpose of evaluation or whether, whether there's some sort of dispute or conflict. Yeah, or, or even whatever. the agents, like the, the agents we mentioned earlier that want to provide that information, they engage inspectors to go and get To support a sale, saying, exactly hey, right. I've already done a – here is the strata report. gives you all the details. Exactly right. And how many of them are there? Lots. Like, lots. <laughs> I mean, there's there's lots of... Uh, I've never really thought too much about this. There's platforms out there that, that give you marketplaces to access them. Um, there's business that have been around for a very long time doing these reports. Um, it's uh, in, in New South Wales in particular, um, it's an extremely common thing to do. Um, but again, you cross a border, you go down to a place like Victoria, you buy a property in Melbourne, strata search is on a thing down there. They mm-hmm. get a basic certificate and it goes to the complete other end of the spectrum where a buyer is actually not getting enough information about the building that they're purchasing in. Uh, they get a very basic report. It might be a handful of pages and then they're putting down a huge amount of money, usually their life savings to purchase something um, I, based I know this. on a very, very basic document. Um, so we see benefits of both simplifying the complicated ones um, and giving more information where it's required to some of the states that don't do their DD properly. So why do they, why do they make it so opaque then, the, the transactions? Because if, if as an investor, if I'm buying strata-based property, you, you want to know what's and all. What what's what are you buying into? Correct, yeah. And I think that's why you hear so many horror stories about people buying into blocks. Mm. Um, I mean, one of my best mates got slugged with 
a huge special levy for a building that he purchased in recently. Yeah. Had absolutely no idea that it was coming. Yeah. Um, and and that's down to a lack of DD, really. Um, it can really impact the investment when you start having to fork out those kinds of big bills. And if you can't pay for it, which happens a lot, you can get sued by the yeah, body corporate, yep. right, that can, can sue you and take you to court. And if you don't come up with it, essentially they've got to, you've got to sell, right? Yep. And good luck trying to sell something if it's got a liability of a huge special levy coming online. Yep. And that's part of the reason why agents love this information up front as mm. well. Because if, if you put your selling hat on, when it comes time to doing a deal, you want to get that contract, that offer on that contract as quickly as possible. And you want that unconditional, right? You want that 66W, yeah. whatever they call it. It's been a long time since I've been in that game. But if you want to wait two weeks for someone to go and inspect the books, to drive over to that strata manager's office, have a look at the information, wait for the report to be generated, come back, have a look, then make the offer, two weeks, you could sell two properties in that time. Um, it's uh, it's a big handbrake on the sale. So the agents like it. They can have the chat with Phil, the vendor up front. Say, Phil, you've got a couple of things coming up just to be wary of, just so you know. Buyers may factor that in. You might be comfortable with that. They proceed to the sale and you've got the information there that you can move forward with really quickly. So this comes back to the point of the accessibility and document do democratization of the information means that agents can move faster, get a sale done, which is the benefit of the vendor largely. It means vendors have, uh, sorry, buyers have greater um, certainty around the the purchase of a, um, a strated piece of real estate because they've got all the information they need in order to make an informed decision and or give them greater clout to negotiate based on anything that might be happening in there. Strata managers get more time back. I, I would imagine and the, the report that I read um, from uh, Real Estate Institute of Australia recently we were talking about sort of property management, which I'm obviously quite interested in uh, uh, through managed was it's still this issue. There's not enough property. There's not enough property managers. Like it is a big deal, right? There's not enough property managers in Australia. I don't want to use the term burned out, but a lot of property managers are up against it. You know, it's 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 a hard job. Like a, pro a lot of people think, oh, it's easy, just an amateur job. Being a property manager is a tough job. It's yep. a tough job, and and it's every day you're, you're on and you've got to deal with people. Again, people probably being the biggest problem. You've got tenants, so you've got landlords, so you've got to try and manage. It's a tough slog. Yeah, strata um, managers are in the same boat. Stra strata managers are in the same yep. same boat. So this is where technology needs to be an enabler to support. Um, and, and this report was talking about the mental health of, of property managers. Like, how, how do you how do you make property managers, and I, I would also say strata managers, happier in their profession and their professional life? It's through giving them the tools for them to do their role better. And if you've got happier and more engaged property managers or strata managers, guess what the outcome of that is, is that they're going to stay around, they're going to enjoy their job, you're going to continue to build this aspect of the industry. But the consumer, i.e. the tenant, the landlord, the buyer, the seller, gets a better outcome as well. Most certainly. But also all the other owners in the building. But mm. right? if, you, if you buy into a block that's well managed, you've got a good strata manager who's happy in their job, um, you've got access to information so the buyers that join or, or, or buy into that building know exactly what's going on. You've got a benchmark on what is the best way for managing a building and understanding exactly where you can add value. Um, the most well-managed buildings are the ones that always set the records, right? They're, and, and they're true. immaculate um, because all the owners, they communicate together. They've got a plan of attack. Um, they understand exactly what will add value to each of their individual lots, and that's maintaining a building as a collective. Uh, welcome back, Phil Tarrant, with uh, Tom Richards from Cohabit. That's, so I've been thinking about this idea of sort of people, property and technology, This how they all work together as, as the sort of the, the three central pillars to the real estate sector in Australia and, and, and on the, the people side, I'd like to sort of dig a little bit more in the future into sort of tradies and that, that aspect of it. You know, that's the, um, that's the critical area I think for Australia is to create and grow more tradies. And, and even today in the paper, they're talking about getting more female tradies. It, it is a really, really, really good profession of people to choose. Uh, and it's holding us back, not having enough tradies out there and or we need to support that with more skilled migration, but then that causes other problems, implications. But people is the challenging uh, part of it all. Um, but people who are engaged and connected within a strata arrangement create value in their real estate asset. 100%. That, that's simple. Ha the happier people are, the more engaged they are, the more cohesive they are, is a better property which is going to be more attractive for people to transact in. Yep. And people are looking at that when they buy into a property as mm. well. Uh, I mean, you, you have a strata inspector that looks into history, look into disputes. Are there any issues? So is, does a strata inspector do that? No, certainly. And yeah. would that sort of form your score?
like so you score a building. So you would score it against whether or not it's full of people that argue all the time and litigate. So that's always that's always something that inspectors look for. They they look for disputes and yeah. and uh, and pieces of information. And th- and then what they do is they provide an insight per se. Okay. So what they do is they provide their interpretation of the data. So we've coined the term insights. Um, so what we've done is we've actually hired a team of inspectors. So we actually have our own internal data team. Um, and then they provide insights on the building data as the buildings get digitised on the platform. So it's kind of the best of both worlds. Um, we're not naive. We know technology can't solve every problem. You still need the people. As we said, it's it's always going to be back to the people and, um, and, and the insights they can provide and the experience that they can offer. Um, so we do that behind the scenes as well. But they always look at that kind of thing. Um, it, it, it's always something that buyers are concerned about. Are they buying into something that's going to be an absolute nightmare where people are afraid to walk out into the hallway in the, yeah. their common area. But better happens, right? You know, like more and, often and, than not, and, and and people sit there and just go. They they wait for seven oh one or whatever the time is, and going. You're not allowed to have parties now. You got to, got to be quiet. They're knocking on your door, banging on your door, getting a broom and banging on the roof <laughs> in the old school way. But it matters, right? And as a a property investor, and and a lot of people tuning into this podcast are property investors. They might not think about this. They're just looking at the asset as in oh, it's two bedrooms in a walk-up red brick building in any given place or as whatever. Like, it actually matters, this. And and it's got an inherent and intrinsic value on your asset. Of course. And it's one of the things that people don't consider when they're buying an investment. You go through a conveyancer, lawyers are very black and white. Hmm. They'll look at the information. They might get a report. They'll look at it and say, yeah, there's no outstanding debts. There's no issues with this building that we can see. All good. But there's very little insights when it comes to livability and lifestyle and, and those kinds of factors. Mm. And they has, have a massive impact, not only if you're going to be an own occupier, but if you're going to in, uh, invest in a property and rent it out, the appeal to the rental market is really important as well. Um, is this building well maintained? Is, is, is my tenant going to enjoy living in there? Or are they going to move out after six months because it's, it's falling to bits and now I've got four weeks worth of vacancy while people walk in, turn their nose up and walk out? Um, it, it impacts you financially having a, a, a livable building. Oh, it's a huge impact. And if you have a transient um, tenant base because, you know, the old lady up the stairways is impossible to live with or you get ambushed whenever you take your, your, your bins out because you're not separating your, your recyclables from weirdo, like people just aren't going to tolerate it. Again, it's back to people. They're not going to tolerate it. And that means it's going to devalue your investment. I don't know how you score this, right? How do you do sort of like a, and I'm generalizing, right? But like, you know, that, an old ladies index, as in the livability of something as a renter based on the other people that are living there. Yeah. So we, uh, we work that at this stage. I mean, as the data grows, the the system will grow um, and, and the more our system will learn. But we do livability based on amenities within the building, yeah. um, how well they're maintained. Um, we have feedback from residents within the block. Okay. Um, so there's only so much an inspector can know from looking at a piece of paper. Yeah. But Tom, who's been living in the building for three years, I've got a pretty good understanding that that gym has awful equipment and I'd never use it. So that means I've got to go and pay $60 a week for the fancy gym across the road. Um, little things So you like might that. get sold on the idea that it's got a gym and a pool and stuff, but no one uses it. Yeah, it's got a medicine ball in the corner and yeah, that's about yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, yeah, and this is ground truth, right, you know, when it comes to uh, – it's intriguing that you, you scratch the surface on it and, and you actually realise that real estate is a people – it's a people – yes, you have a relationship with the bricks and mortar and what you live in, but it's, it's – particularly if you're cohabiting. Yeah, it's people-driven. So, and again, this is going to be a hugely generalised question, but in the spectrum of buildings that you've seen and connected with or on the Cohammock platform, what, are most of them okay or are most no. of them like <laughs> pretty – Yeah, you know what I'm trying to get at is like, is like if you looked at a, a bell curve, like, you know – how how much of a bell curve is it or how flat is it? Is it – if you look at a spread of the worst to the best, are they all about equal or most of them are sort of okay? I'd, I'd say okay would okay. be uh, – and especially by our standards, um, we are being quite stringent when we're in terms of benchmarking. Yeah. What you find – I mean, it's the same with all, all the other businesses, right? You find the outliers, which are the absolute leaders – and then there's the majority, which are okay. Yeah. Um, and it applies across every industry, but specifically when it comes to buildings. I mean, it only takes a quick search on domain, have a look through some of the apartments available to see some of the things that people try and rent out these days. Yeah, yeah. Um, but hopefully this will give you more insights, understand 
what can be done to make that experience better for the people living together. Um, and I think that a lot of people don't know. Um, as an owner, you lose touch when it becomes an investment. It sort of becomes this thing that sits in your combank list. It's just this mortgage. The money comes in. You get a statement from the agent. I don't know any of the investors, none of my mates that are investors ever really look through their ingoing condition reports, right? They don't scroll through the photos. It's just sort of over to you, agent, but they don't really understand what's going on in the building. Mm. So and that's, that's the key point. You need to understand what's going on because um, it's inherently connected with the value of the business. I was reading only today as well, uh, scrolling through uh, the papers, that units, uh, I think it was CoreLogical or one of the data houses are saying units will grow faster than houses in this next period of time purely because of the disparity in price points and um, uh, the fact that units are so much more affordable, right? They're saying u units is is where a lot of growth is going to take place, which is cool. Um, there's other people who say, well, it depends on what unit you buy, uh, which is... I get that as well. So buying huge, buying into huge multi-complicated, multi-development complexes, which are brand new in areas of growth, might not be as good as an investment as something which is a bit more traditional. But what would be the sort of non-negotiables for you as a property investor when you're when you're buying into a unit complex? What what are the biggest red flags to look out for? Yeah, I mean, for me personally, I've got quite a a, a big list of wants when I buy into a building. Mm. Um, but a, a smaller building is definitely one of them. Um, is 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 one of my preferred um, aspects of buying into a block. Um, mm. Being able to control that community a little bit more, understanding who the people are, um, being able to easily make decisions on improvements, um, being able to see whether there's like-minded people within the building. Um, understanding the split of owner-occupied and investment. If I'm buying an investment, then that's fine. I'm not going to be living in it. But yeah. typically you find an, uh, someone that's looking for an apartment to live in, they don't want to live with a whole bunch of, of tenants, right? Yeah, true. So there's, there's lots of factors like that that I look at. But for me, ultimately it's around how well-maintained that building is. I want to know that that compliance history is bang on. I want to know that when things have popped up, they've, they, they've been taken care of really quickly. I want to know that they're thinking about adding value to the, the building. Have they just let it go? What are the gardens like out the front? What's the lobby like? Uh, I want I want people to take pride in where they live. Um, so that's what I'd look for when buying into a block. Yeah, true. Uh, I was catching a mate of mine the other day. Uh, he's out from Miami and uh, and we're having a laugh about real estate out there. And, and he said he lived in... OnlyFans Towers is what he called it. <laughs> oh, he's, he's in every building in Miami, OnlyFans Towers. <laughs> he's got OnlyFans Towers. He just goes, just full of OnlyFans people. Like, he's got OnlyFans Towers. So, you know, be careful what you're buying. Maybe some people might be attracted to that, but, like, be careful what you're buying into. Yeah, there might um, be a few of those down in Bondi, I Maybe imagine. bringing us some OnlyFans <laughs> Towers out there. Well, that might increase the value of it all. But, um, you know, as more Australians probably will, will live in units moving forward, um, you know, the inherent... Um, uh, asset is going to be the quality of the building matched with the quality of the tenants, matched with the quality of the information that people can access as part of it. And I guess that's where Cohabit sits, right? You know, using technology to make what has always been an analog thing easier and better for all. And that's essentially property technology yep. at the it, moment. It applies to all the different players in our uh, in our industry. Yeah. Do you think this – where else can prop tech go? Is it, is it just going to be more of the same or is it, is it going to be – is it going to be still for the next period of time transitioning old analog practice, the same, so the same practices analog, but making them digitised and digital to make it easier and more seamless? Yeah, I still think there's a lot of analog practices out there that I see. I mean, people still want, even from back in the managed days when I was working um, with you guys, the amount of people that wanted their statement via post. It was still a prominent thing. Um, people still want stuff by post. People still want stuff by post. Um, yeah. and, and, it's, and now you've got platforms out there that are actually integrating with the prop tech and then posting something out for you so you can do it en masse. Yeah. Um, so things like that, there's still a lot of room to move with some of the old antiquated processes, but it's going to take a big generational shift for that to disappear. Right. So when that, when, when that nonna doesn't want her, uh, her, her statement via post and the granddaughter or the, or the daughter or the granddaughter take over that particular portfolio, you're going to see a demand for something like Manage. They want to be connected. They want the same experience from their property they get from their internet banking over at Combank. So, so we're still really early days with property technology. Most really, certainly. Because yep. so there'll be a catch-up of digital natives. So Gen X is sort of sitting this sort of this, this sandwich, right, where old and new and then you've got Gen Ys and everything else. So there will just be 
the inherent shift away from analog to digital because there's just that's what people do. Yeah, exactly um, right. Which, and, and we're probably quite far down that process now. There's still some outliers around it, but they're talking about the the biggest generational shift of wealth about to take place over the next sort of 10, 15, 20 years. You're going to see the biggest generational shift in terms of how people embrace technology, new technology around real estate and transactions over that same period of time. Those two things will work in lockstep. So it's good to be in prop tech because, you know, if you've got a good process and good platform, a good system, you just need to wait for the world to catch up with it. Yeah, most certainly. And you can see that in the investment into the industry as well. I yeah. mean, you look at CB Insights and the volume of funding that prop tech platforms have received, um, it's astronomical. Uh, yeah. And that means there's, there's cool things coming because it takes time, right? I mean, it's uh, it, it you, from the moment you get some money or, or decide to do something, it can be years before you have a viable product. So yeah. you've got to remember that all these really cool platforms, there's, they've probably got a roadmap of two to three years worth of really interesting things. And it's, it's quite exciting to see what's going to come out over the next little while from these businesses that have established and really want to push that boundary a little bit. Yeah, and I think that's the opportunity for us to explore that moving ahead. You know, how, how do we how do we have some sense analysis, interpretation and narrate this, this shift and change to uh, the property sector embracing technology? And we've just spoken about some of those points today, but technology can be a huge enabler for better decision-making. That's what it should be. Yep. It should make your life easier. It should make your life more productive. It should make your life more transparent. It should make people's jobs better, and this is the people bit, and it should make people's relationship with property more efficient and effective, whether you buy it, you're an investor, you live in it, or you rent it, right? And and that's the focus. So maybe this is the start of something, Tom. We can sort of try and work this out, uh, right? And, and, and the point that you made is that, yes, you can sit around and you can wait for the generations to catch up with this, which will just force it anyway, but how do we help people change and shape their mental... How do, we, how do we help people change and shape their mindset towards this quicker so they can get the benefits of it? And what I'm there is talking, I'm talking to property investors, absolutely. Uh, I'm talking to the real estate professionals out there as well. So real estate agents, property managers, buyers agents, get on board with tech. Those, those Your life the, will be better. That's the key, yeah. the, is, is the people that have that direct relationship with the end user. So the real estate agents interacting with buyers, I see that as the fastest way for people to get comfortable with something like that. Okay. Yeah. I like it. All right. Let's get you back on the show. Thanks again, Phil. Let's, 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 let's build some around this, I think. It's uh, really good. Uh, so cohabit mainly for buyers, so people buying residential real estate in, in units, property investors and stuff. Would I go to your platform and go, oh, my building's not on it yet, or you're working on getting more buildings on it? How's that work? Uh, so you can request a building to have a cohabit report as well. Uh, okay. So if the building's not there, you jump on, you punch in, the data team goes and collects that, the report will be collated and you get a push notification on your app, or you can just get an email um, once that particular report is So that's is the ready. best place. That's probably how you want to grow people saying, hey, I want to buy into this building. I'm going to put a request in for my building. That's okay. Please do. Yeah. I'll give you a I'll credit. That. Really? All right. Can I get a freebie? <laughs> <laughs> I'll, 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 let, let, me do, let me do a, a test drive and I'll come back and report to everyone about it. But, Perfect. Uh, all right, yeah, so so if you are looking to buy, you know, go, go and just Google apartment prices today when you tune in, you'll see how it's going to grow. I think you're going to get more buyers of apartments moving forward. You can get, you, you guys will just, you do the hard work, you go and create it. Exactly yeah. right. All right, good. Cohabit, C-O. H-A-B-I-T. That's pretty, dot .com.au. That's it. All right, go and check it out. And, and if anyone wants, I, I I've got to do it because I'll, the marketing people give me a hard time. Uh, if you actually want direct and automated uh, rental transactions as a property investor, a managed app, M-A-N-A-G-E-D app.com.au, go and check it out. Uh, if your property manager isn't yet using managed and you want money in your bank account at the same time, same same place when your tenant pays it, uh, go and chat to the team there and uh, I'm sure they could help them out. Uh, this is smartpropertyinvestment.com.au. Uh, also tuning in on realestatebusiness.com. Did you everyone? I'll be up at ARIC uh, spending some time. I'll be up there as a journo uh, with REB, but uh, also uh, through um, my uh, connectivity with the prop tech sector uh, through managed. So if you're up there, come and say g'day. Uh, be good to have a chat. I'll be doing podcasts up there and, and having some yarns of people trying me to help uh, uh, change and shape um, my focus and attitude towards property technology and how we can continue as an organisation to get behind it and uh, propel it into what will be a very bright future. We'll see you again next time. Until then, bye-bye. 
The information featured in this podcast is general in nature and does not take into consideration your financial situation or individual needs and should not be relied upon. Before making any investment, insurance, tax, property or financial planning decision, you should consult a licensed professional who can advise whether your decision is appropriate for you. Guests appearing on this podcast may have a commercial relationship with the companies mentioned.